the notion of self-consciousness is only completed in these three moments. A, the pure undifferentiated I in, is its first immediate object. B, but this immediacy is itself an absolute mediation. It is only as a supersession of the independent object. In other words, it is desire. The satisfaction of desire is, it is true, the reflection of self-consciousness into itself or the certainty that has become truth. C. But the truth of this certainty is really a double reflection, the duplication of self-consciousness. Consciousness has for its object one which of its own self posits its otherness or difference as a nothingness, and in so doing is independent. The differentiated, merely living shape does indeed also supersede its independence in the process of life, but it ceases with its distinctive difference to be what it is. The object of self-consciousness, however, is equally independent in this negativity of itself, and thus it is for itself a genus, a universal fluid element in the peculiarity of its own separate being. It is a living self-consciousness. We're now arriving at an important transition point. We're reaching the end of the very first portion of this section, self-consciousness, a major part of Hegel's phenomenology in which some really key concepts have been developed, some key notions. And what Hegel appears to be doing in, in paragraph 176 looks a lot like summary. We can actually lay it out in a, in a fairly systematic, almost schematic form. And, and why can we do that? Well, he says that at this point, the notion, the begriff, the, the concept, you know, remember how important this term is for Hegel, of self-consciousness has attained a, a completed state, or if you like, it's reached its fruition, it's vollendet in, in German. So I, a little bit of, of caution here. I don't think that you want to assume from Hegel saying that, the you know, sort of sweeping conclusion that now we're all done, with self-consciousness, we've seen every bit of its development, because that's clearly not true. We have, you know, a number of paragraphs yet to go through, um, you know, this much of the work. So, you know, there's still a lot of work ahead. But some, some really important dimensions of what, what self-consciousness is have been worked through, and we've arrived at a key conclusion that now we're going to sort of unpack. So... Let's look at the summary as Hegel puts it out. He um, breaks it down into three moments. The, the first moment has to do with the pure, undifferentiated I. We, we saw that in previous paragraphs. Then we see um, you know, what self-consciousness as desire, desire in, or, in orientation to desire as coming out of, but also superseding life, um, how that works and how desire, you know, aims at satisfaction in the object. And then we reach some, some paradoxes of desire that we've just talked about in previous paragraphs. And then we arrive at this really interesting feature of the duplication of self-consciousness. Now, this is, in some respect, new at this point. And so we're going to have to explore, well, why, why is there a duplication of self-consciousness as such, and not just a duplication of you know, it wouldn't be a duplication, just this play of self-consciousness and its objects. So let's look at each one in turn. Hegel says, um, in this first moment, the, the first object for self-consciousness is this pure, undifferentiated I. And you might say to Hegel, well, wait a second there. When I become aware of myself in, in moments of self-consciousness, I'm not becoming aware of myself most of the time, at least empirically, as this pure, undifferentiated I, contentless, you know, rather abstract. What, what's going on here? And, and Hegel could have two good responses to that. One is that in tracing out this development of self-consciousness, he has been examining what we might call uh, from a phenomenological perspective, the essential structures, the, the you know, metaphysics of, of the, the person of self-consciousness. 
So, you know, of course his analysis, you know, being a phenomenological analysis is based to some degree in experience, but it's supposed to in some way transcend the, the particularities of individual experience, because otherwise it's just, you know, sort of pure idiosyncratic you know, stuff that pertains only to me. We've already gone past that, remember, with sense certainty? We saw a dialectic of the, the you know, the concrete eye and the abstract eye back then. Um, so that's, that's one possible response. And Hegel can also say, well, look, you know, if you attend to your experience closely enough, you will, in fact, find yourself referring, you know, some of what's going on to this, this pure, undifferentiated eye. This is the power of the negative that he talked about in, in the preface, consciousness is by its nature a kind of freedom, which means that it, you know, this is going to sound rather Sartrean, isn't, you know, just what it is. It can be other, and it can make other things other by negating them. And that's what this pure, undifferentiated I does. Now, we saw that, you know, that is not going to be a resting place, of course. Um, you know, we're not trying to derive some sort of transcendental category of the I, which then we would take refuge in uh, a la certain types of transcendental philosophy. Instead, Hegel has said, no, we need to now go through a process of, of you know, becoming more and more concrete uh, through experience. So he talks about desire. And you know, so I've got this term supersession there. We know that's that's Aufhebung, you know, this this transcending and yet incorporating the essential moments of things. So what is it that desire really wants? Desire aims at the supersession of the at least being presented at the time independent object or other. And I, I put object slash other because you know, the object is something that is other than self-consciousness. And when we're experiencing the other as an other, as we're going to with self-consciousness, you know, the other self-consciousness, we are taking them as an object. We also make ourselves into objects uh, in, in the process as well. So that's what desire wants. And desire is seeking satisfaction, befriedigung in, in, in German. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, a being... Uh, being able to enjoy, being able to, to consume, uh, consuming by negating, by nullifying. And why is desire seeking that in the objects that it is? You know, you might say, um, what am I trying to do in, in reading this book? My desire is guiding me into the book, and I want to consume what's there. I want to make it my own. I want it no longer to be so independent of me that it's out there by itself. I want to incorporate it. And what I'm trying to do there, Hegel says, is to have both my cake and eat it too. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to have certainty, and I also want to have truth. And we, we've seen that there's this interplay between truth and certainty, where oftentimes, you know, you can start out with the one, but then you, you get led away trying to have the truth, and you realize you lost the certainty in the process, or you're trying to grasp the truth, and you start with that, and then you're, you know, concerned about how to restore the certainty. These are two important aspects that are not often well held together. They're, they're often, you know, splitting apart from each other in the dialectic. In any case, that's what desire, uh, you know, is, is, is looking for, for self-consciousness to be able to bring together certainty and, and truth. The way he puts it is... Um, you know, the satisfaction of desire is the reflection of self-consciousness into itself or the certainty that has become truth. Certainty that has not lost its truth uh, in the process or truth that has lost certainty, but something that has brought them together. Now, how is that possible? It, it, it takes place through the negating of the independent object as independent. That leads us to a problem. This is where we're going to get the duplication of self-consciousness. And I, I, you know, I could probably put a couple more exclamation points here because this is an absolutely important feature. Uh, this is going to run throughout the rest of this entire section. This, this you know, fact that we've got two self-consciousnesses, or actually more than two, but you know, two at least in, in the, the interplay that we're looking at. So how do we get there? Well, you know, we talked about the paradox of desire satisfaction, right? 
Um, what is the paradox of desire satisfaction? It has to do with this independence. In order to make the object its own, to consume it, it has to, in effect, uh, bring negation to or, or, or reduce to nothingness the object. Yet if it does that, what happens then? It loses the object in the very process of consuming and enjoying it so that now it doesn't have that. And like Hegel just said in the you know, past paragraphs, then it's condemned to this sort of repetition, this reproduction both of the object, the new object, and of its desire towards the object, which again can't be satisfied with this, this interplay. So what's the possibility? We saw this at the end of the last paragraph. Well, an object that posits its own nothingness, right? That, you know, introduces negation into itself. That, you know, if we want to put it in other more metaphorical terms, an object that abases itself, an object that humbles itself, an object that offers itself to us. So, you know, this is, this is quite important. He says, um, consciousness has for its object one which of its own self posits its otherness or difference as a nothingness, and in so doing is independent. So it becomes even more paradoxical here, right? Because this self-negation is only possible because the object actually does possess an independence. So it brings otherness, it brings difference to itself, it brings nothingness within it. Now, Hegel doesn't use this term, but this is what is actually going on here. The object is being revealed to us as a subject, or as better yet, a subjectivity, much like our own, right? Because what kind of things can pull that off? So here's the question. Why not just the object as another living thing? Why can't that work for self-consciousness? You know, um, why can't you just go retire into nature and, you know, experience that and engage with other living things? Why do you need another self-consciousness? Well, he tells us here, right? Um, the differentiated, merely living shape does indeed also supersede its independence in the process of life. You know, what does that mean? That means that the, the thing that's alive is indeed engaged in this process of organic growth, response to its environment. It becomes other to itself, you know, in, in a way that, that mere objects don't. So this is very important. Uh, but we saw that life refers to something beyond mere life. It refers to consciousness, for which life is. Life can only be life for something that is not just life. So he says, um, it does supersede its independence in the process of life, but it ceases with its distinctive difference to be what it is. So there's a lack of continuity there's a restrictedness to the living thing. We might, you know, here, instead of saying thing, say the living plant, the living animal, right? Um, better animal than, than plant. But we cannot find the sort of satisfaction that we're looking for in those because they don't have the kind of subjectivity that a human being does. I don't want to get into any great debates about whether octopi have subjectivity or dolphins or anything like that. You know, Hegel did not know as much about animal behavior as we did. He was also, you know, inheriting from the ancients a notion that, you know, being the rational animal were fundamentally distinct from the others. So perhaps there's, there's you know, possibilities for something more to be included in there. But let's just go with what he actually says. The object for, for self-certainty, for this, this you know, desire that we have, must be, he says, an other living consciousness. And I put here self-consciousness in parentheses because that sort of goes without saying. What we're actually desiring is an object that can negate itself and do so in time, concretely, in relation to us, in the way that we ourselves can, and now think about this too, we can also know it to be doing that because it is like us. So what is it that we're actually looking for? 
we're looking for another self-consciousness. He says, the object of self-consciousness is equally independent in this negativity of itself, right? It can negate the way that we can. Thus, it is for itself a genus. The entire process that we have just sort of spelled out for ourselves as, you know, traveling along this, this developing consciousness, the developing self-consciousness, is also going on over there in that self-consciousness, and over there in that self-consciousness, and with the one that we want to relate ourselves to, the one in which we want to find our consummation and our satisfaction of desire. So he says, it is for itself a genus. It is for itself the same kind of genus that we ourselves are, at the same time being part of the same um, you know, genus in terms of being human beings. Each one, uh, we're going to see this play itself out very much in, in the later sections, is also like its own genus <coughs> or species or type onto itself. We have to explore it in order, in order to find out what it is. We can make snap judgments about the other, while well, you're just one of those kind of people, scratch the surface, and in most cases we find out that's not really the case. There's this interiority that goes beyond what the other living things have to offer. So this is what's going on. Um, has the entire you know, concept, the entire begriff of self-consciousness been exhausted? No. But now we actually have a lot to work with. A self-consciousness exists for a self-consciousness. Only so is it in fact self-consciousness, for only in this way does the unity of itself and its otherness become explicit for it. The I, which is the object of its notion, is in fact not object. The object of desire, however, is only independent, for it is the universal indestructible substance, the fluid self-identical essence. A self-consciousness in being an object is just as much I as object. With this, we already have before us the notion of spirit. What still lies ahead for consciousness is the experience of what spirit is, this absolute substance which is the unity of the different independent self-consciousnesses, which in their opposition enjoy perfect freedom and independence. I, that is we, and we, that is I. It is in self-consciousness, in the notion of spirit, that consciousness first finds its turning point, where it leaves behind it the colorful show of the sensuous here and now, and the night-like void of the supersensible beyond, and steps out into the spiritual daylight of the present. We're now at the crux, the ending of this portion of the, the self-consciousness section, uh, where our transition is going to be made to the other parts, which are even more complex. There's a lot more going on there. Uh, and then eventually to, to further sections. And Hegel thinks that we've made a really significant advance. Part of that is, you might say, latent in what he's talking about at the very start of the, the paragraph in, in 177, which is going to be then you know, played out in, in this diagram that I've got here. But part of it is also what we're seeing at the very end of this, this passage, and so I want to begin with that um, and talk a little bit about its implications. So he says, It is in self-consciousness, in the notion of spirit, that consciousness first finds its turning point, where it leaves behind the colorful show of the sensuous here and now, and the night-like void of the supersensible beyond, and steps out into the spiritual daylight of the present. So what we're talking about here is uh, not, not leaving behind as in, you know, totally disregarding, um, but rather this process of, of aufhebung, of sublation, of bringing along with us, but getting past and showing how this, you know, leads to something greater. Uh, you know, something new is coming on the scene that we have to now assimilate. And so, you know, the, the possibility of being captivated with the, the, you know, the empirical world that we're confronted with, um, the world that we think is the world of experience, but which is only a world of, you know, sensuous experience, and then the super sensible beyond, you know, this is with the force, laws, the, the you know, the, the inverted world, all that sort of stuff, and, you know, um, the, the play of consciousness. Now we're stepping out, as he says, into the daylight of self-consciousness, which is going to lead us ultimately 
to spirit, which is what this whole thing is about, the phenomenology of spirit, right? So we're really making some progress. Now, he begins by saying self-consciousness is, the book has exists, but is it might be a better way to, to put it. Yes, this, you know, you can translate it either way. Self-consciousness is, for another, self-consciousness. You don't get self-consciousness concretely by itself. You might say that the very metaphysical prerequisite of having one self-consciousness is that there be more than one. Well, this is really interesting. Consciousness by itself doesn't necessarily imply this. Self-consciousness, which we would think would, could be just you know one unity, um, doesn't exist as self-consciousness without other self-consciousness, without an interplay between them. And you know this is this is a, an idea that's been played out an awful lot by um, some Hegel commentators and scholars. You know, most notably by Kojev, who really begins his study of Hegel by thinking this this particular term out. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, other than to say that in this, I think that that uh, Kojev is on the right track. That when we think about determinate human beings we can abstract away, you know, imaginatively from the relations with others. Or we could look at it in a, a way that seems to be, you know, metaphysical, but is really, um, you know, treating individual human beings as if they're subjects or substances, when um, the very nature of human being, part of what makes us what we are, is that we are relational creatures. We are relational with each other. So I cannot have my entire being in myself and then just relate myself to another being that's perfectly you know opaque and finished by itself rather we are always in in process and we are always in messy relations with others here the, the relations are quite so messy uh, because we're trying to keep it simple but if you think about the way it is for us in, in real life it is it is quite messy so he goes on and he says only in this way does the unity of itself in its otherness become explicit for it. Only by relating ourselves to another self-consciousness can we be fully aware of the unity that we are, because that's not a unity of just like a closed off, you know, exactly what it is throughout all of its tissues sort of thing. Our unity is a unity in connection with other unities that have the same capacity. So he says, um, the unity of itself in its otherness. We are self-othering. Um, if we weren't, we couldn't have followed along with the entire thing that Hegel's been doing here because the very dialectical logic that he's been following out where even, you know, uh, you know things that don't have consciousness but are only for consciousness, have alterity, they have a capacity to self-other, you know, there's this repulsion of the self-same from the self-same, the attraction of the unlike to unlike, all this sort of stuff, we're able to understand because we are that kind of creature. But we can only become aware of that in relation to another self-consciousness, or fully aware of that, we can only work it out. So he says, the I which is the object of its notion is, is in fact not object. The object of desire, however, is only independent, for it is the universal indestructible substance, the fluid self-identical essence. So let, let's show you how I, I'm trying to lay this out for you in, in a schematic form, right? So the I, um, which is the object of its notion, is in fact not object, right? Um, it doesn't remain merely objective. That's part of what it means to be an I, to have that capacity for negation, that capacity of, of freedom, that um, distancing itself from, from concrete empirical existence, which seems to like fix it to, to points from which it cannot deviate. So that's, these are both aspects of the self. The self, uh, the self-consciousness, makes itself an object for itself. We've seen this play itself out. At the same time, it is also that which is able to stand back and say, I, it's both of these at once. So it's both sides of, of the, not the equation, but both sides, both moments of the, the dialectic there. 
Same thing is going on here with the, the other self-consciousness. And, you know, when we're talking about desire, desire is, is connecting us or coming out of this fluid self-identical essence, which is what? Which is life. Uh, what we've been parsing out and, and looking at um, in the last paragraphs. So he says, A self-consciousness in being an object is just as much I as object. When we make ourselves into objects, or when we see ourselves as the objects for another, right? When, when the, the other self is looking at us as an object and saying something like, hey, you. That hey, you includes both sort of a dictic reference. It's sort of like you know, putting the, the pointer out and treating somebody in, in many respects as an object. Because you could say, look at that tree over there, right? At the same time, it's being addressed to another person. In language, at least in, in most languages, I don't know if this holds for every language, we have the second person, right? You, thou, thee. Um, you know, we, we differentiate between sometimes um, singular and, and plural. There's, in Greek, there's actually dual and other things as well. What's going on there? Something is being treated as both object and as I at the same time. When I'm trying to, to you know, think about myself, as I might be doing as I'm thinking about this board and, and the diagram there, where do I fit in there? I am treating myself both as object and as, as this I, as a subject. So that's something uh, really central to, the, to this. Oops, oops. I faced the other a little bit. Levinas would be so angry. Um, okay, so he says, uh, with this, we have already before us the notion of spirit. So this is a key idea, right? There's this interplay going on here. Self is related to other. This is the other to this self. At the same time, this self over here, which is the only kind of other, I should probably do this, right? Uh, if, if this other isn't a self, it can't satisfy my desire. It can't give me my own self-consciousness. I also realize that within myself, there's othering as well. And it's othering for the other people. This is how complicated this is getting. There's a lot of reflection going on here. You can tell I'm getting very excited about this as well. But that's because this is really central stuff. This is a very, very important paragraph. Now, desire is one of the key things that is connecting all of this together. As we saw, my own desire is not entirely my own. It is partly already over there being conditioned by the other. That means the same thing about the other's desire. I exist as a self-consciousness because I'm related to a self-consciousness, which also feels desire towards me in the same way. So we leave behind the realm of just life, which is still a basis, is still there, is still involved. It's just being sublated. And we're seeing how we get through this play of desire to what Hegel is calling the notion of spirit. Spirit is what the whole book is about, as I, I mentioned before. So he says, um, it was a beautiful passage here. What still lies ahead for consciousness is the experience of what spirit is. That's what the rest of this book is, the experience of what spirit is. So he says, um, this absolute substance, which is the unity of the different independent self-consciousnesses, which in their opposition, right, these are opposed to each other, they can be related to each other in a lot of ways, enjoy perfect freedom and independence. Sounds very utopian, doesn't it? That's because we're not going to get to this position of absolute freedom and independence and, to use another term that he's going to bring in very soon, recognition between the different self-consciousnesses in spirit. We're not going to get there right away. Human, humankind hasn't actually gotten there all the way. Even in Hegel's own time, he thinks that he's figured out the blueprint for this, but it has to be put into effect within 
existing societies which have to be transformed in the process. Now he says what, what I think is, is you know, most wonderful about this. He calls this I, that is we, and we, that is I. So that is, at least at this point in the game, how we can characterize what's going on with spirit. I, that is we, and we, that is I. How do we bring together the, the self-consciousnesses to create a we? It's very easy, and this is you know, something that happens all the time when people are pushy, to you know, have one person using we terminology all the time, and they don't just mean the royal we, like, you know, we shall have a, a grilled cheese sandwich, and they mean I will have a grilled cheese sandwich. They mean, you know, we're going to do all this, this stuff together. I just happen to be the one who can, you know, orchestrate it and who knows what each person ought to do as a member of the team, which, by the way, I'll run, and I'll have the handouts for you when, when you come to the meeting. That's, that's not what Hegel's talking about here, but we often have to transition through that because we have a tendency to subsume the, the we into our own I or to take on somebody else's I as what's you know, going to give us the we that we can be involved in. These are two things that have to be overcome and we're going to see him talking about how this is done. I don't want to end on, on that note. I want to end on sort of reaffirming what we, we began with and what we end with in this passage. This is opening up for us a new way of looking at things. All the previous consciousness material is still there. We've brought it along with us. We've, we've used parts of it that were, were um, particularly helpful at certain points. Um, some of it's going to reemerge later on. But now we are taking a fundamentally different perspective, not so that we can nullify everything, but so that we can broaden the, the viewpoint that we have and see how these self-consciousnesses actually relate to each other.